American government, campaigns and elections. Nothing symbolizes democratic government more than an election. In the case of the United States, Election Day represents the culmination of a very long and expensive campaign. We have marathon campaigns here for federal office. That's different from European campaigns, which tend to only last a few weeks. We have marathon campaigns that go on and on. In the U.S., they last for many months, in part because we have primary, sometimes caucus elections beforehand. This means major candidates have to run first uh, to win their party's primary race against other people who desire the party's nomination. And if they win that primary or caucus race, they have earned the right to represent the party in the separate, later, general election that actually decides the winner of the office in question, whether it's a House seat, Senate seat, etc. Our marathon campaigns infamously also include a lot of advertisements, which is somewhat unusual. A lot of other countries prohibit or ban the use of televised ads, for instance, while others restrict the time period in which ads can be shown. To a small degree, we do some controls. You can't show up with a lot of campaign stuff to vote, for instance, or within so many yards of a polling place, but our, we pretty much give a lot of people, everyone involved in an election, pretty much free reign to kind of say what they want about an election or about candidates. In sum, the American campaigns are often loud, long, and laborious affairs, both for the candidate and the public at large. This is true of House, Senate, and presidential races alike. All three offices do contain um, a primary and caucus component where the parties select their nominees, followed later by the general election in the first week of November. Yet, the outcome of our federal elections often depends less on what the candidates do during this marathon than on factors beyond the candidate's control. The most significant of these factors is voters' partisanship, their loyalty to one party or the other regardless of the candidate. When the campaign starts, most voters have already made their choice, even if they don't admit it or won't admit it to a pollster. When Election Day finally comes around, the great majority of self-described Republicans will back their party's candidate, while Democrats will line up overwhelmingly in support of their Democratic candidate. And at times in American history, one party's had such a huge advantage over the other that its presidential nominee could have probably stayed home away from the campaign trail and still won the election with or without any ads. After the party realignment of the 1890s, for example, there was a three-decade period where only a single Democrat, Woodrow Wilson, was elected president. He was lucky. He slipped into the presidency in 1912 with just 42% of the popular vote. Republicans that year split their vote between the party's nominee, William Howard Taft, and their party's former Republican president, um, Theodore Roosevelt, who came back from safari in Africa and ran as a bull, a bull moose progressive party candidate. Today, the two major parties, Republicans and Democrats, are much more evenly matched than they have been in the past. Voter preferences have been more stable during recent campaigns than from earlier ones. There's generally been a lot less switching from one candidate or one party to the other as the campaign moves along due to our intensifying political polarization among the American people. More and more people are clustered closer and closer to the fringes, which means when an election comes, people have a much easier time deciding who they're going to vote for. They sort of already know, regardless of who the candidate's going to be. In a previous talk, I mentioned the, number of, the growing number of American voters of professing um, independence, that they don't belong to either one party. There's a counterpoint to that claim, though. Estimates of the number of actual swing voters, swing voters, people who conceivably actually vote for a Democrat or Republican or a third party candidate, um, those that today could conceivably be, be won by either party during the marathon campaigns, estimates vary widely. However, analysts put this number at roughly 5 to 10% of eligible voters. Either way, it's a smaller number than the roughly 20% of voters who were legitimately up for grabs in presidential elections just a few decades ago. We have an interesting phenomenon happening. More and more people saying they're independent, but fewer and fewer people are actually willing to vote for other major party candidates. Candidates also have to deal with the fact that election turnout in the U.S. is incredibly low by global standards. Turnout of eligible voters in a given presidential election year when a lot of people are paying attention is just under 60% of eligible voters. It means tens and tens of millions of eligible voters stay away from the polls every four years when we're electing a new president. Through their get out the vote efforts, get out the vote efforts, candidates can have a small effect on voter turnout. They can drive some people to the polls that might otherwise skip election day. Candidates can also sometimes try to encourage voters 
particularly and strategically goes less likely to vote for them, and more likely to vote for the other candidate, to stay home on election day, mostly through the development and strategically timed deployment of attack ads or negative campaign ads. You'll see candidates really trying to get people to the polls on election day or talking about the importance of voting. Um, that doesn't actually move the needle so much. That doesn't actually get people to the polls more. It's something they have to say, obviously. And it, do, it does matter to a small degree. But they spend a lot of time actually trying to turn people off of the election. So campaign attack ads can serve that purpose. Even if it makes the candidate who makes the attack ad look bad, if they believe the calculus is such that it just discourages more people to stay home, that might still work to their favor. So fewer Americans voting sometimes works in candidates' uh, favor. So when you're if you're sitting all at home thinking, I just don't want to vote, think about how strategic that might be on the part of the candidates running in that marathon race. Candidates can't do that much in the end to alter enthusiasm differences between the partisans. In the 2016 presidential election campaign, Republicans had intensity on their side, partly as a result of having been out of power, out of the presidency for eight years, Barack Obama had won the previous two elections. A Gallup poll taken during the 2016 general election, in the lead up to the election, for example, found an 11 percentage point intensity edge for Republicans. Republicans' higher level of intensity might well have won them the election. The winner, Donald Trump, lost the popular vote to Democratic nominee Hillary Clinton, but he squeezed by in enough states to gain a majority of the electoral college votes. Clinton lost then one or lost by less than one percentage point in critical swing states, states that tend to go either way, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. If Democratic turnout had been just a degree higher in those three states, she would have captured them and won the election easily. In that case, she would be president. The intensity of voter enthusiasm really does matter. The corresponding arguments over the utility of voting, you know, have a lot of people tell you you have to vote. MTV ran a campaign when I was young called Vote or Die, right? Um, those arguments are sort of baseless or sort of irrelevant. Um, the belief that you have a responsibility to vote or not um, doesn't really matter in the end. What's measured matters. So your vote is sought after by political parties. Money is spent to try to capture your vote. Uh, your vote is measured, as is your choice not to vote. So your choice to vote thus clearly matters to a great many people. But whether that ballot itself, the one that you actually cast at the, at the poll, proves influential is in the hands of fate and fate alone. And whether it sort of matters, ultimately sort of up to you. A third factor largely beyond the candidate's control is the issues that voters actually care about. Few things matter more to voters than their sense of whether the country is on the right track or the wrong track economically. You'll see this in uh, poll questions that come up before the election. But this does tend to matter quite a bit. When the outcome of election is decided, uh, pollsters can pretty scientifically report to how people were feeling on that Tuesday in November about the state of the American economy. The economy is doing well. The nominee of the party in control of the White House, whether they're up for re-election or not, automatically gets a boost on election day. But it's believed that the country's doing poorly and nominee has more trouble winning on that election day. Since 1976, four incumbent presidents, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, George H.W. Bush, the elder, and Donald Trump have lost their bid for re-election in tough, uh, tough economic situations. Each one of them was saddled with a weak or deteriorating economy. During his term of office, for instance, Jimmy Carter saw both unemployment and inflation rise sharply, an economic condition referred to as stagflation contributing to his defeat, his surprise defeat, uh, by Ronald Reagan in 1980. Foreign policy issues don't figure all that heavily into the outcome of presidential campaigns, and almost not at all when it comes to congressional elections, except when a war has turned out badly. That invariably hurts the candidate of the party holding the presidency. The Vietnam conflict, for example, contributed to the defeat uh, in 1968 of the incumbent party's nominee, uh, Democrat uh, Hubert Humphrey, was replacing LBJ, who decided not to run again because times were so tough. More recently, the Iraq War, along with a weakening economy, hurt incumbent George W. Bush in 2004, but he nonetheless scraped by. Again, a bit of an upset. His winning margin was the smallest ever for an incumbent president. In 2006, the unpopular war led to a Democrat resurgence in Congress. Keeping in mind that presidential candidates don't entirely control their fate, let's look at how a presidential campaign operates. The United States has primary elections or caucuses, which place a heavy demand on presidential candidates. Instead of a single primary, they actually have to compete in 50 separate state primary and caucus contests. 
I keep using these like they're terms that are replaceable. They're not. Some states have caucuses. It's just a different method of choosing the party's nominee. Iowa has a caucus, for instance. States have a choice. They can hold a primary or they can hold a caucus. The difference is that a primary, the voters simply go to the polls and cast their ballots, just like a general election. Whereas, in a caucus, the voters go to a local site where they meet and discuss the candidates before voting. Caucus participation is more time-consuming and turnout is substantially lower than it is for primaries. But 10 states currently use the caucus method, while the rest hold primary elections. Whatever methods they use, the state's contest determines which candidates' delegates will represent the state at the national convention where the party's nominee is formally chosen, whether Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, Green, etc. Thus, presidential candidates actually compete for party delegates, seeking to win enough of them from the states to have a majority of them by the time their party assembles and formally chooses its nominee that will go on the general election ballot in November. This system was created after 1968, uh, in which Hubert Humphrey won the Democratic nomination, even though he hadn't entered a single primary. At that time, state parties had the option of choosing their delegates through a primary or at a state convention. Most delegates were chosen in a state convention, which was controlled by party leaders, not the people. They provided the delegates that gave Humphrey the 1968 nomination over his chief rival, who had actually run in the primaries and traveled across the country. The people of the states had no direct say that year uh, who was chosen as the official Democratic presidential nominee, and they suffered for it. When Humphrey lost the general election to Nixon, Democratic Party reformers succeeded in bringing about a change in their rules. Thereafter, the states would be required to choose their delegates through either a primary or caucus, the system we have today. The party could no longer control the state's choice for the nominee. Because of that change, presidential hopefuls have no choice but to compete in all of the 50 state contests. They can no longer sit back and wait for the party to come to them, as Humphrey did in 1968. The change has also created a wide open nominating process. The earlier system favored candidates who had the backing of top party leaders before the race even begun. The current system is open to any politician who thinks they can get voter support, no matter what party generally they've been with in the past. The presidential nominating process is a lengthy one. In simple terms, it has three phases. First, in the months leading up to the first primary and caucus contests, candidates raise money, engage in televised debates, hit the campaign trail, spending most of their time in the states that hold primaries or caucuses earlier, the people who will go first, right? Then in January of the election year, so 2024 is coming up net right now at the time of this recording, the state's first contests are held. This has traditionally been Iowa, but it's, this is not set in stone. It could change. That contest is followed sequentially by the 49 other contests. Traditionally, it's been New Hampshire, Nevada, and South Carolina. After these four states vote, the other states are then free to hold their contests. Usually, several states will schedule their contests on the same day within a short period after the Nevada caucus, creating what's called, um, or what's come to be known as Super Tuesday, when a ton of the delegates are chosen. Finally, in the summer after the states have voted, the parties hold their official presidential nominating conventions where the state delegates come together to formally choose the party's presidential nominee. They typically choose a major city in a state uh, the party hopes to do well in in coming election cycles, generally swing states that could go either way. After losing Wisconsin to Donald Trump in 2016, it's no coincidence that Democrats chose the state to host their 2020 convention. I think I can read your mind. You're thinking, well, if the states have already had their uh, choice and have um, had their primaries and caucuses. Why do they have a nominating convention then if the people from the states choose? And that's true. The, uh, the convention is now largely just a formality. Since the rules were changed after 68, one candidate has always captured enough state delegates to win the nomination on the first ballot, though controversies continue. It took a concerted effort by the Democratic Party's so-called superdelegates to give Hillary Clinton the nomination over Bernie Sanders in 2016. That's not a term that's up here. Super question mark. But the parties, particularly the Democratic Party, does still try to slant some uh, power toward party officials despite the states weighing in. This lack of grassroots enthusiasm for Clinton uh, presaged her eventual loss to Donald Trump. A fast start in the first caucuses and primaries has been shown to be a potential springboard to the actual party nomination. As one scholar wrote, there is no time for losers in presidential politics. Voters aren't interested, donors aren't interested, and reporters are not interested in a candidate who 
finishes at the back of the pack in the early races. Although a degree of success in early contests tends to be vital by itself, early caucuses and primary results cannot accurately predict the eventual party nominee. The better predictor is the candidate's ability to get in a strong position before the first votes are even cast. Scholars describe this period of the marathon as the invisible primary. The invisible primary. It's a time even though no votes are about to be cast when the candidates try to put in place the elements of a winning campaign they will need. Name recognition is one of those elements. People have to recognize who you are and what you stand for by looking at the ballot and your name. Unless voters know who a candidate is, they're not going to back that candidate. And it's hard for a candidate who lacks name recognition to acquire it. When George H.W. Bush ran unsuccessfully for the presidency in 1980, he campaigned long and hard before Iowa. And yet a poll taken shortly before the Iowa caucus found that only 8% of Iowa voters, Republican voters, said they were aware of him. Well, 53% said they had thought his name sounded familiar. Nearly 40% said they would never heard of George Bush. Candidates who start the campaign with poor name recognition are doubly disadvantaged because they inevitably end up at the bottom of the pre-campaign polls. The news media cue off those polls, concentrating their reporting on those who are at or near the top. It's a classic catch-22. You need the press to acquire name recognition. You need the press to pay attention to you. But if you don't have name recognition, it's hard to get press coverage. Rarely is a candidate able to come from nowhere to win in Iowa or New Hampshire, for instance. Conversely, at the start of the 2016 Republican race, the candidate with the highest level of name recognition was Donald Trump was a widely recognized public figure whose reputation had grown in recent years as host of The Apprentice, a popular TV reality show. Trump also had a second publicity advantage. He was skilled at attracting reporters' attention. His fiery statements on everything from immigration to trade to his constant speculation about the birthplace of President Barack Obama quickly found their way into the media headlines. In the period leading up to the Iowa caucuses, Trump received a third of all news coverage given to the 17 major Republican contenders. To be frank, he was ratings gold for cable television. He got twice as much coverage as the next most heavily covered Republican and around 10 times more coverage than most of his Republican uh, contenders. By the time, the, and this is in the invisible primary, by the time the Iowa caucuses rolled around, Trump was far ahead of the Republican uh, competitors in national polls. His victory over Hillary Clinton in the general election may have been a global surprise, but his Republican nomination was more like a coronation bolstered by the fact that he was so familiar to the voting public. They knew what he stood for. Fundraising is also a key part of the invisible primary. It takes a huge amount of money to mount a successful campaign for national office. Estimates of the minimum run upwards of $50 million for presidential contests, fundraising and donors. Not surprisingly, in the year before the state contests, candidates devote a great amount of time to fundraising with varying degrees of success. The news media, as they do with polls, see fundraising success as an indicator of which candidates to take seriously and to focus coverage on. As with the polls, money and media go together, and all of this money is clear, uh, clearly tracked and made public. The more press coverage a media gets, the easier it is for that candidate to raise additional money, another catch-22. Barack Obama's 2008 campaign for the Democratic Party nomination illustrates this point. Even though Obama, a relative unknown at the time, trailed badly in the early polls to his main Democratic rival, Hillary Clinton, he astonished the pundits by raising $26 million in the first quarter of 2007 alone. As a result, his news coverage shot up, boosting both his poll standing and his fundraising efforts. By the time the Iowa caucus rolled around, Obama had raised $102 million, roughly on par with the heir apparent Hillary Clinton was able to raise. When Obama won those Iowa caucuses, I remember that night, it was seen as a huge upset. But for those paying attention to the candidates' fundraising totals, and some people were, it wasn't that surprising at all. Raising a large amount of money before the primaries is important because it enables the candidates to spend heavily on critical first contest campaign ads, while also buying early TV advertising in the Super Tuesday states, where a lot of those delegates are won. A candidate, when visiting states, can only be seen in one state at a time. Money allows the candidate to have a presence in a lot of states at once, via over-the-air radio, internet radio, local television, highway billboards, mailers in the mail, and social media spending. The invisible primary and the race to out-fundraise your opponents cannot guarantee the outcome of a national party primary race. Candidate must still campaign effectively 
when the voting gets underway and, and avoid major gaps along the way too. Let's proceed finally to the presidential general election. By this point in the campaign, the race has narrowed to major party candidates, generally with the Republican Democratic nominees attracting by far the most interest and attention, although there will be other names on the ballot. What determines their strategies? How do they try to win the presidency? In the end, nothing matters more than the Electoral College. Each state has electors equal in number to its representation in Congress, House, and Senate combined. So that's 435 total, representing the House, 100 for the Senate. Uh, the District of Columbia actually gets three. Um, so that is DC. So there's 538 electors that will be chosen in the election, and the winner will need 270 electoral college votes to become president. A candidate who gets a majority of the state's electoral votes, up to 270 or more, wins the presidency. The popular vote winner for the presidency, voting by the people, is a piece of trivia only. It doesn't actually matter who wins the American presidential popular vote. You've heard this before. This is why. What matters is how the states vote. The election is by the states, not the people, although the people vote. They're telling their electors who to vote for. All states, excluding Maine and Nebraska, apply what's called the unit rule in allocating their electoral vote. I think this is very interesting and very misunderstood. The candidate who gets the most popular votes in a state gets all of its electoral college votes. If there are three candidates running for a state's electoral votes, and say you know, one's a minor party candidate but gets 5 or 6% of the overall vote, whoever gets the majority in that specific state will win all of the electoral college votes for that state. Think of the state of California. If someone gets 40% of the vote, someone gets 39% of the vote, and the other candidate gets 21% of the vote, the person who got 40% of the vote will win all of that state's electoral college votes, even though the majority of the state wanted someone else for office. Maine and Nebraska do it differently. They do not apply the unit rule. They divide their electoral college votes based on the state's popular vote, something I would encourage all proponents of discarding our electoral college system, and there are very loud voices saying we should disassemble this. They should consider dissolving the unit rule and doing what Maine and Nebraska do, which is more representative of what the people of their state would do, who they want for office. But I digress. So in terms of candidate strategy, which states are most important? It is true that the most populous states have outsized influence in the Electoral College. California, for example, has more than 50 Electoral College votes, nearly a fifth of the 270 votes needed to win the presidency. If you win California, you're about 20% of the way there. But from a strategic perspective, a state's competitiveness is far more important. California is largely ignored by both major party candidates during the general election. Because since the mass late, uh, last major party realignment in the late 60s, it's historically heavily Democratic. It used to be Republican. As a result of the state's use of the unit rule, its electoral votes are all but known in advance. Republicans likely aren't going to win in any upcoming election, so no one even runs there. For either major party candidate to campaign there currently would be a total waste of time. That's the case for most states. They are heavily enough Democratic or Republican that the, off, the outcome is likely not in doubt because of the unit rule. Accordingly, candidates concentrate overwhelmingly on what are called the battleground states or the swing states. Swing states. I like battleground better, actually. Those states that could conceivably be won by either side. Either it's one party's to lose or another party's to gain. During the 2016 general election, roughly 95% of Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton's campaign appearances were concentrated in just 12 of the 50 states. Those states, where both candidates had a real shot at victory. If states decided to abandon their unit rule and apportion their electoral votes in alignment with their state's popular votes like Maine and Nebraska, we'd see this pattern change overnight. Show me an incentive and I'll show you the outcome. U.S. presidential campaigns are costly affairs. In 2016, Trump and Clinton together raised and spent hundreds of millions of dollars. Clinton had the clear fundraising advantage, outspending Trump nearly two to one. Nevertheless, as was true during the nominating phase of the 2016 campaign, Trump had less need for advertising dollars because he succeeded in securing most of the news coverage at absolutely no cost to his campaign. The news media's fascination with Trump and the advertisement revenue he generated for networks like Fox News, CNN, and CNBC kept him in the headlines when his campaign dollars simply could not. 
During the general election, most of the money that the candidates spent goes to buy televised ads in battleground states, those 12 states I mentioned. Many candidate advertisements are negative in tone. They are attack ads aimed at eroding confidence in the opposition candidate. Candidates' media strategists believe it's easier to persuade someone to vote against an opponent than it is to get them to vote for their candidate in many instances. Hack ads also get the attention of the news media, which can act as a megaphone carrying the message to those who didn't see the campaign ads directly. Attracting media or the public to talk about an ad has the effect of amplifying its message. Attack ads also help fire up the party's core voters. If they think the opposing candidate is unfit to be president, they're more likely to get involved, to donate, etc. That goal, getting one's supporters whipped up into the polls, has become increasingly important in recent election cycles. Decades ago, American presidential candidates aimed more moderate TV messages at persuadable voters in the political center. They're still a prime target today, but there are fewer and fewer of them as a result of party polarization. Today, candidates increasingly use ads targeted at those individuals already supporting the candidate, seeking to get as many of them to the polls on election day as possible. That strategy was first employed by George W. Bush in 2004. His chief strategist, Carl Rove, believed that more votes could be gained by targeting the Republican base during a difficult wartime re-election campaign than by trying to convert swing voters in the party. It tried to talk to Republicans who likely wouldn't plan on showing up to Election Day and convincing them to just show up. Candidates have always done both of these things, directing appeals at the persuadable in the middle and extorting the faithful to vote. But the balance between the two has uh, shifted somewhat. No candidate has pursued this turnout strategy more effectively than Barack Obama did in his 2012 re-election campaign. Obama's strategist recognized that the sheer voter enthusiasm that had driven his 2008 victory had been expended. He was no longer the overwhelmingly popular figure he had been in just a few years prior. So the Obama campaign team set out to build the most massive targeting and get out the vote organization ever assembled. The effort involved hundreds of thousands of campaign volunteers, a mobile app which allowed a volunteer to identify and contact everyone in his street and enter their opinions into a master database, all without having to meet with a campaign supervisor. Volunteers knocked on 7 million doors, very strategic doors, and contacted more than twice the number of voters by phone. The Obama campaign contacted 50% more voters than did Republican candidate Mitt Romney's campaign and delivered a targeted message to each person contacted based on both past voter behavior, etc. Obama won a race many candidates, and myself included, and many other people, thought he would lose. When it comes to Congress, politics tends to be a local affair, but national trends and stories, including the public's perception of the current presidential performance, seem to influence House and Senate races more and more each election cycle. Factors outside of any one campaign, including voters' party loyalties and the top issues of the moment, tend to affect the outcome of presidential races and, to a considerable degree, are beyond the candidate's control entirely. As political strategist James Carville once quipped, it's the economy, stupid. What he meant was, media, campaigns, polls, they matter. But all of these things serve at the mercy of the individual American voter standing alone in a voting booth, trying to reconcile his or her personal interests with their public concerns on a Tuesday morning in November.